Perhaps it might be a good idea for those of you who really don't know an awful lot about this to just step back a bit and say, well, how did typesetting and printing come about anyway? And I'm sure many of you out there know that it goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. In the Far East particularly, it was possible to uh, make marks on paper for Chinese, Japanese, Arabic characters hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Those of us in Western Europe often fall into the trap of thinking, well, really, printing was invented in 1456, I think it was, by Johann Gutenberg in Mainz in Germany. And of course, he produced the famous Gutenberg Bibles. But I think in all fairness, you've got to say he didn't invent it. He rediscovered it, perhaps. He refined the techniques and so on. So to give you some idea, I've got here a sample of wooden type. And if you look down here, it's actually for a font called Caslon which some of you may even have the modern form of under Windows or on your Macintosh or whatever. That's just a display case, but it, it shows in many ways the way you used to have to set your type. You had to have a wooden frame as big as the page size that you wanted. If you had type of this huge size, fine. You could even <laughs> handle it with your fingers and put it in in exactly the uh, layout and format you wanted. Most of the time, you didn't have the luxury of anything that big. That is metal type. It's metal type for a font called Univers. It's effectively, a, if you like, a sort of French equivalent of the Swiss Helvetica type. It's sans serif, very clean, very nice. But just look at the size of it. This is 10 point Univers. Can you imagine that if you wanted to set one of your papers or your letters with individual pieces of metal type, you would be down to having a wooden frame armed with your nimble fingers and tweezers maybe, if you're going to set at 10 point, you'll be picking these up, putting them in lines, having to accept the fact, if you think about it, you're going to put paper on top of these and ink, make an impression, therefore these have to be mirror images in order to look right when you take the paper off. And typically if you're on a A4 size page, you're looking at something 25 times the area of this, all to be done by hand and all to be made absolutely perfect, no typos, no nothing. And how do you space the lines? Well, up at the top of this box, there's some flat looking pieces in there. And those are pieces of what nowadays would be called leading if they're made in lead type, which I don't know if this is, but anyway, the leading is the line spacers that go between your lines of type. So you had to insert all those, you had to make the lines look even. The next stage is to gently roll ink all over it, not too much ink, you don't want blots to appear on your paper. And you would then put it in a press, very much like a, an apple press or a cider press. It's got a great big plate on it, it's got one of those screw threads with a big handle at the top. And the idea is uniformly and under high pressure to press the paper evenly onto the inked type. And then you take the pressure off, pull off the paper. And if you're skilled enough, you've got a beautifully inked version of what's there in your type. From Gutenberg's time, for the next 400 years, nothing fundamentally changed. What changed in all of this in the late 19th century was that the setting of metal type, instead of having to be done by hand, became mechanised. Methods were devised for using these type samples almost as masters and being able to replicate copies of them in a thing called a typecaster. And once you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of type, enough to do a whole version of the Washington Post or the New York Times or whatever, then what you needed was some way of mechanizing the placement of this replica type. That machine was invented in Germany in about 1880, I think, or thereabouts, by a gentleman called Otmar Mergenthaler. He founded a very famous company called Mergenthaler, the parent company, but the name of the machine that did all this was the liner type. And as its name implies, it set lines of type, which is exactly what the newspaper industry wanted. A little bit later, a rival came along, worked under different principles, which tended to corner over the years rather more the if you like, quality end of the book market rather than 
newspapers that had to be bashed off every single day of the week. That was known as the monotype machine. I'm not saying there weren't others, there were plenty of others, because um, type was a, a good way to make a good living, so long as you had the craftsmanship and the skills and so on. But the big two were certainly monotype and linotype, like the General Motors and Ford. There were others, but those were the big, big names. Well, uh, Apple and uh, Windows. <laughs> yeah, Apple and Microsoft, maybe. So, that technology persisted for about another 50, 60, 70 years uh, of just setting metal type and putting it in a printing press, pressing the paper down and, and so on. But the next big revolution that came along from about the middle 1940s onwards was the idea of having your type not as metal but as, if you like, photographic images of the characters. So if you can imagine it, inside a big light type box, you would have a, on a circular drum, a strip of film that's got the whole, shall we say, of Times Roman upright at the top. And then below it, Times Italic, all the characters, Times Bold, Times Bold Italic. Not all worked on exactly this uh, principle, but it gives you the idea, and certainly the one they got at Bell Labs, this sort of second generation typesetter, was very much like this. So I'll stick to this description. You've got all of your characters in the current font available as photographic images. What you've now got to do is to transfer the photographic image of the capital letter S, shall we say, from the strip onto a piece of photosensitive paper at the back of the box. And remember, this is all light tight. So what you have is an unbelievably complex system of mirrors and lenses capable of either shrinking or expanding the master letter S to be either 36 point or 6 point or whatever you're wanting. So the sizing was done optically by magnifying and diminishing. And when you were happy that you'd got the letter S to the right size, this all takes place in milliseconds, I might say, with great noise in the background. Then you say, right, I'm ready to print my letter S. So you would fire a strobe. A strobe light would take the image of the letter S, focus it down through a fiber optic bundle, and the fiber optic bundle would be positioned just above the photographic paper at the back at exactly the place where the letter S needed to be imaged. And then you'd move the bundle a little bit off to the right, and then maybe you'd do a lowercase letter a next door to it. So you can probably imagine it was mechanised, but it wasn't ultra fast. You've got a lot of things to move, a lot of synchronisation to do in firing lights and so on. But nevertheless, it worked. And monotype and linotype had machines working on this principle, but they weren't the only ones. And the interesting thing is, that at Bell Labs in the early 1970s, they actually had one of these true phototype setters. It was made by a small firm called Graphic Systems Inc. of Massachusetts. So, I've forgotten to ask Brian exactly how much it cost, but it, I would reckon tens of thousands of dollars. Armed with that, the computer science section at Bell Labs developed an extended text formatting system called TROF, which was capable of typesetting to this machine. I should say that the GSI was just about computer drivable. As it was supplied to you, the idea was to drive it completely off paper tape, which you prepared offline. However, it was possible to buy some extra electronics. It was not a dedicated mini computer even in those days, it was far too early. It was specialist electronics you could buy, which would enable you to interface a parallel port type interface um, off a PDP-11, shall we say, and to drive it directly from a PDP-11. And that's exactly what Bell Labs did. So there they were with a text formatter, which had been developed in the late 60s, early 70s, there were a lot of them around. There's one at MIT, I think, called Runoff. Joe O'Sanna at Bell Labs developed one called ROF. And what happened in those early days was, if you ran ordinary ROF, normal ROF as it were, just to a text formatter that wasn't a typesetter, 
Again, it's back at this sort of quality. That was called NROF. Okay? But if, in the future, you wanted much better quality material, you would have something developed called TROF. And TROF, standing for typesetter version of ROF, was capable of producing properly typeset output looking just like this. That's the way it was at Bell Labs from about 1972 to about 1979. There was TROF and its two preprocessors. A guy there called Mike Lesk developed one called Tubble for typesetting tables. You wrote in a tabular language how you wanted your tables um, laying out and Tubble's job was to translate your high-level spec into low-level TROF code and to squirt it into TROF. Brian and his collaborator at the time, Lorinda Cherry, wrote another one uh, which was really just made your jaw drop open to actually typeset mathematics. And it's hard for me to believe, actually, even now, that with the aid of EQN, as of 1972 vintage, you could very easily typeset a page of that sort of complexity. This is actually from a little bit later on. It's a University of Nottingham examination cover sheet. But that's the sort of mathematics typesetting you could do with using EQN to drive this TROF program. By the end of seven or eight years of very, very heavy usage, the poor old GSI cat was on its knees and uh, Brian and his gang decided that they just had to have a replacement. And by that stage, the third generation had come along. The third generation of typesetters actually used mini computers and actually represented the fonts as data inside a computer file. The only problem then is, well, it's all very wonderful, but how do you actually get an image? How do you make an image? How, you know, what do you do? Well, in the third generation, typically, you used a very high precision cathode ray tube to image your characters. Of course, as you all know, cathode ray tubes were the technology for televisions for many, many years. And yes, you could make a cathode ray tube, you still can, to be very high precision indeed. And by high precision, I'm talking about, shall we say, 972 dots to the inch. Now, if you're going to make it that high precision, you are certainly not going to have a widescreen TV at that sort of resolution. Not in those days, anyway. This was where the actual imaging took place. And here, there is a cartridge holding the silver bromide uh, positive paper or your photographic negative film. And underneath this black cover is the high resolution cathode ray tube. Somewhere, yes, is a picture of the high res cathode ray tube, which is like a letterbox. And essentially, blue bit there? yeah. And essentially, what happened was you exposed the bromide paper in bands. And when you'd finished doing the current band, you mechanically moved the bromide away from it. If you wanted to do superscript and subscript work just by, as it were, dodging and weaving within the letterbox. That could be done without moving the bromide, and that was very much favoured. Mechanical alignment problems were a big, big issue. You had to have very high quality gears with no backlash, because if you're setting a two-column newspaper, and if you decide to do it by doing the left-hand column first, and then winding back the bromide to the top and doing the right-hand column next, you didn't half uh, come across alignment problems that the two sides didn't really match up. And so it was very much favoured exposing it in a band if you're doing two-column work to arrange in your software to hop the gutter, as it, were, as it was called, do it all in one go, do a bit of left-hand column and a piece of right-hand column at the same time. 